Hey guys, welcome back to the Mind of Brandon, and welcome back to another Sunday of Science and Spirituality. As indicated by the title of this video, I am doing battle with William Lane Craig's White Knight. The inspiration for today's video is a comment that I received on a previous video of mine titled, William Lane Craig's Best Arguments for God Debunked. So let's go ahead and have a look at that comment. His argument from contingency is about why contingent things, like the physical world and objects in it, exist, when they very well might not have. Abstract concepts aren't things. So you're going to open by stooping to a semantical argument. All right, well, since you started it, I'll go ahead and finish it. Let's have a look at some definitions of the word thing. Oh, wow. There's, uh, there's some versatility to the use of this word. But the part I found most useful for my purposes was this part. An abstract entity, quality, or concept. So it turns out that an abstract concept actually is an example of a thing. And the idea that energy can't be created is a misapplication of the first law of thermodynamics. Now, I didn't get that from any law of thermodynamics. That's an Einstein quote. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. But maybe you think that even Einstein is misapplying some law of thermodynamics. So let's go ahead and have a look at your reasons for thinking so. All the first law and related conservation laws says is that in a closed system, the energy amount is constant and can only change form. Oh, really? That's all it says? Let's look at the first law of thermodynamics. When energy passes as work, as heat, or with matter into or out from a system, the system's internal energy changes in accord with the law of conservation of energy. Equivalently, perpetual motion machines of the first kind, machines that produce work with no energy input, are impossible. Huh. Looks as though it says a little more than what you are claiming it says. And it makes no mention of a closed system. It does make mention of a system, but it doesn't seem to care whether it's a closed system or an open system. In fact, I get the impression you don't even know the difference between a closed system and an open system. An open system is defined as a system in exchange of matter with its environment, presenting import and export, building up and breaking down of its material components. Closed systems, on the other hand, are held to be isolated from their environment. So the difference between a closed system and an open system has less to do with whether energy can be created and more to do with the exchange of matter. That said, I think that part of the reason you're confused has to do with the association of the first law of thermodynamics with the law of conservation. In physics, the law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system in a given frame of reference remains constant. It is said to be conserved over time. Now, this in no way indicates that energy can be created in an open system. It uh, really has more to do with whether energy can be destroyed. Of course, the point that it's making is that it cannot. Energy is conserved, or at least energy is conserved in an isolated system, in a closed system. What about in an open system? Well, to clarify, uh, energy is not going to be destroyed in an open system either. Energy can, however, be moved, okay? So if we're dealing with an open system, uh, then any matter or energy associated with that open system can uh, be added or, or subtracted upon uh, because it, because that open system can exchange matter and energy with its surrounding environment. This is why when you're researching this stuff, you're never going to find examples of situations where, oh, yeah, yeah, in, th in this situation, energy can be created, or in this specific situation, energy can be destroyed. You're never going to see that because energy is never created or destroyed. Okay, it can be transferred, it, it can move, it can change, but it cannot be created or destroyed. But if you're assuming the physical world is a closed system, you're begging the question with regard to theism. Well, that was not entirely coherent, but I think I've adequately put in perspective that the question of whether it's an open system or a closed system is actually irrelevant to the question of whether energy can be created or not. Energy cannot be created in either an open system or a closed system. Two, 
From nothing, in this context, just means without pre-existing materials to form it out of. This is pretty obvious. Of course he doesn't mean without God and his powers to create. If I say you drew that conclusion from nothing at all, I don't mean that you don't exist or that you didn't speak. I just mean you didn't form the conclusion from pre-existing stuff like an argument with premises. God caused the universe to exist without forming it from anything else. If the point that you're trying to get across is that Bill Craig wasn't using the word nothing the same way that I'm using the word, well, that's not exactly a point in his favor because that means that there's some specified thing that he's referring to as nothing. As I already mentioned in the video you're commenting on, uh, in the Bible, the way that God creates in the, in the book of Genesis, you know, he says, let there be light, and then there's light. He says, let there be a firmament, and then there's a firmament. You know, he speaks things into existence with the power of his voice. So for Bill Craig to say that God created the universe from nothing, it's like he's basically saying that the voice of God is nothingness. But it turns out that one of the ways that voice can be used is as a noun. And what is a noun? A noun is a person, a place, or a thing. Also, the Big Bang and expansion is not an explanation. It's what needs explaining. Except that the Big Bang actually is an explanation for the expanding universe, and an exploding hypothetical primeval atom is an explanation for the Big Bang. Atoms are, of course, made of subatomic particles. Subatomic particles are made of elementary particles, which are tiny little ripples or, you know, vibrations of energy, and energy has just always existed. Three, without the finely tuned initial conditions, there wouldn't even be chemistry. There wouldn't be planets or stars at all. This is standard cosmology, and you look a bit foolish acting as though Craig has invented this himself. You no, know, th that is not standard cosmology at all. Dude, you need to watch like some Neil deGrasse Tyson or something. That's a that's an astrophysicist here on YouTube, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, he, he's got a, a great video on stupid design. Okay, he's not he's not exactly making a case for uh, that there being some god that finely tuned the universe for intelligent life or something like that. Y yeah, no. Besides. You need a solar system that develops like ours did to get a planet like ours. The side effect of that is a solar system like ours, including all the like prohibiting planets. For what it's worth, Jupiter has shielded us from so much interstellar debris that it has proven crucial to life on Earth. And I'm sure that the way this works in your mind is that that means that Jupiter was intentionally put there by God to protect Earth. Okay, why is there debris in the first place? Okay, th this is the kind of thing that Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about in his lecture on stupid design, okay? Space is out to get us. If, if, if God wants us to live, then there's no point in creating these planets to protect us from debris because there's no point in creating that debris in the first place. You need a universe this big and this old to get a solar system like ours with the materials for making an Earth. So the emptiness out there is no argument at all that the universe isn't finely tuned to permit intelligent life. Well, actually, if I understand correctly from another Neil deGrasse Tyson lecture, uh, other Earth-like planets could have formed up to 400 million years prior to our planet. And to clarify, Bill Craig and I weren't talking about whether or not the universe could permit intelligent life. Obviously, it permits intelligent life. What we were talking about is if it was finely tuned for intelligent life. What I was pointing out is that it's clearly not for intelligent life. Four. You may say morals are 100% subjective, but no one actually believes torturing a little girl for the fun of it is morally equivalent to loving and caring for her. Okay, for someone who doesn't believe in objective morality, there's no such thing as morally right or morally wrong. And so that means that it doesn't make sense to speak of this act being morally equivalent to that act. That doesn't exist if there's no such thing as objective morality. Some things are actually wrong. Oppression of minorities, mass murder, suppression of free speech and thought. If any of those things is actually wrong, not just a matter of opinion or preference, but really wrong, then Craig's premise is true. Then his premise isn't true because none of those things are objectively wrong. 
That doesn't mean they're objectively right. They're not. Okay, it's not it's not right or wrong. There's no such thing as morally right or morally wrong. It's just something we made up. As it turns out, there are people who think that we should oppress certain minority groups, that we should mass murder certain groups. There are people that think that we should suppress speech and thought. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that all of these different arbitrary subjective moral values that people have that they try to pass off as objective moral values uh, is actually stirring up some trouble. That's not a moral disposition, though. It's one of practicality. Let me put it this way. There's no such thing as morally right or morally wrong. There is, however, such a thing as factually right and factually wrong. It's factually wrong that all white people are morally superior to all black people. In fact, moral superiority is factually wrong to begin with. It doesn't exist. But it is factually right that white people have the ability to go around enslaving black people and forcing them to do the jobs that white people don't want to do. However, it's also factually right that we have the ability to automate all the jobs that nobody wants to do, which would also be more practical and just better for everyone. I don't mean morally better. I mean it's better for the well-being, for people's you know, health and sanity, etc. In fact, if we were to declare the Earth and its resources as the common heritage of all the world's people, updating everyone in the world to the present state of science and technology, automating all the jobs that nobody wants to do. We could give everyone in the world access to food, water, clean air, clothing, shelter, medicine, a relevant education, transportation, entertainment, plumbing, and electricity, all without a price tag, because of course you don't have to pay machines. And this has the potential to create a world in which there's no more war, crime, poverty, starvation, slavery, overpopulation, pollution, or bigotry. So we don't need any set of arbitrary subjective moral values. What we need is to apply the scientific method for social concern. If God is defined as a logically necessary being, then possibility actually does entail actuality. It's called Moral Axiom S5. Do your research. Actually, as I've already established throughout the course of this video, as well as in many other videos that I've made, God is not logically necessary. We don't need God to account for the origins of the universe or the origins of life. We don't need God as like a moral compass or anything like that. Uh, we're better off replacing our arbitrary subjective moral codes with the application of the scientific method for social concern. And no one was saying you have to think God is possible, but that's a way higher burden of proof to sustain for the person who wants to argue God does not exist. If this argument is sound, then that person needs to show not only that God doesn't exist, but that he couldn't have existed. That there is some logical impossibility entailed by the statement, God exists. Good luck with that. I ain't afraid of no burden of proof, right? Ain't no burden for me. I've done enough research into this stuff that making a good case against the existence of God is actually pretty easy. And it's fun! Don't get me wrong, there are some conceptions of God that someone can bring to the table and I'll say, well, you know, maybe that exists. Or, you know, in some cases I might say, well, yeah, that, that definitely exists, but I'm not going to call it God. You know, because sometimes people are just kind of deifying energy or they're deifying the Big Bang, whether they realize that's what they're doing or not. Because, you know, sometimes people are just kind of deifying whatever it is that set in motion the formation of the universe or they're deifying whatever it is that's responsible for the generation of matter. If they're deifying whatever is responsible for setting in motion the formation of the universe, they're deifying the Big Bang. If they're deifying whatever is responsible for the generation of matter, then they're deifying energy. So when I act all confident about the fact that there's no such thing as God or, or that God couldn't possibly have ever existed, that's referring mainly to the God of the Bible. Uh, although there is, an, you know, an array of other gods that I could be as, you know, I could be equally confident. Well, 
because Zeus didn't exist, Ra wasn't real, right? And there's there's all sorts of gods from ancient mythology. I can say, yep, that that's not real. You know, anytime you got like a a volcano god or a moon god or you know so, some some god that represents some aspect of nature, uh, you know, it's it's easy to kind of put in perspective. Well, ancient people didn't understand that aspect of nature. That's why they deified it. Now we know what's actually going on, though. If you know what's actually going on, then it shows you this other thing is not what's going on. And that is precisely the exact same logic that demonstrates that the God of the Bible couldn't possibly have ever existed. So, since we have this ubiquitous, indestructible, eternal energy that generates matter, and we have the Big Bang, and evolution, and a globe Earth, it kind of goes to show that this other stuff that we're seeing in the Bible, that stuff ain't real. But thanks for the comment you left. I did have fun responding to it. Uh, hopefully this video was helpful to somebody in some way. If there's anyone that wants to help me out, I do have a Patreon account linked down below in the description box. You can go there and donate if, if you want to. Uh, so that's it for this video, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it with other people. If you're interested in watching my future videos, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and I will see you all in the next one. So have a good one, guys, and peace.